Good morning and welcome to Trinity Baptist Church. Uh, the youth are leading in both services today and we're glad you're here to worship with us. If you're a guest this morning, we want, you to, we want to say a special welcome and the, uh, to fill out a welcome card that's in the pew in front of you. Uh, you can put it in the offering plate when it comes your way later in the service. There are a few announcements in the bulletin that I'm going to highlight. So today there's a deacons meeting at 3 p.m. in the sanctuary. And tonight is a staff night, so there's no uh, p.m. activities. Wednesday night, our Ash Wednesday service is um, at 6.15 here in the sanctuary. The youth and RAs and GAs will be attending the service, and mission friends will have their regular class on the preschool hall. Uh, Friday and Saturday, there's a marriage workshop. It begins Friday night and continues on Saturday morning. There's free childcare there, and a sign-up sheet is in the gathering area. Next Sunday, there's a Valentine banquet from 5 to 7 p.m., and free child care for that event is offered as well. There is a sign-up sheet in the gathering area, too, and more details are in your bulletin. Please stand now for the passing of the peace. I'll come down after it's my thing, right? I don't want to sit back up here. I leave after I do all my whatnot. Say my thing and then go sit down. Our scripture for today is from Matthew 9. At this point in his ministry, Jesus is busy preaching, healing people, and calling his disciples to follow and help him. Our younger youth are actually reading these middle chapters of Matthew for their discipleship groups this month, and there's a lot of ministry and teaching to read about. Part of Matthew 9 deals with the calling of Matthew. Pastor Mike has been preaching about what it means to be a missionary, and today Ben and John are helping him in considering the call of a missionary. Welcome to worship. Pray with me, please. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the blessings you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you together. Please let your word spoken today help those who need to hear it. Watch over and protect us all and bless the, your word to, to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. and singing Lord I need you the words are printed in your bulletin
God calls us to be still and know that he is God, but that takes time, and we're busy with so many things. Here is what one writer says. Whatever the pace, time will keep it, and there's no outrunning it, only speeding it up and pounding the feet harder, the minutes pound faster too. Race for more and you'll snag on time and leak empty. Hurry always empties a soul. I speak it to God. I don't really want more time. I just want enough time. Time to breathe deep and time to see real. Time to laugh long. Time to give God glory and rest deep and sing joy in just enough time in a day not to feel hounded, pressed, driven or wild to get it all done yesterday. I just want time to do my one life well. Please join me in taking a few moments to pray silently. Dear God, we thank you for this day and for the time that you have given us. We pray you help us slow down to truly live in this world you have created. Please be with us as we go forth in this week. In your name we pray, amen. All right, good morning. Okay, we'll try that again. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. All right, I got the privilege of reading the scripture today, which is Matthew 9, 9 through 13, and 35 through 38. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn from what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Jesus went through to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the new good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Good morning. Thank you all so much for this opportunity. It's a, it's a rare time that you get to see a church that actually lets people come to the pulpit, especially youth, and preach to them. Um, and thank you to Pastor Mike for sharing it with me today. It means a lot to me. When I, when I met with Pastor Mike, when me and John met with him, when, I, when he told us what we were preaching on, I really had never heard the verse before. I knew Matthew was a disciple and that he had to have been recruited to be that. You don't just become a disciple out of nowhere. But I had never really read it, and I never would have expected how it would affect me, and I did not know how I was going to write an entire sermon on it. As many of you may know, I am a senior, and so that means I'm going to be going to college soon, and that involves a lot of stress. Where am I going to go? Te what are my test scores to get in those places? What are the application deadlines? What am I going to major in? What am I going to do with my life? And what if I have an awful roommate? <laughs> And this can all seem very overwhelming to someone who isn't really good at making decisions. You can ask my parents. So when I started reading this, it was like God was sending me a message that he had a plan for me. No matter what I do in my life, no matter where I go to college, no matter what I do as my job or starting a family, God will always have a plan for me. Even though sometimes it might feel like 
I don't know what that plan is at the time, or maybe I just feel like God forgot about me. It's nice to know that Jesus always has a plan for me, and he proves this with Matthew in verse 9 when he goes up to him at his tax collector booth and pulls him out of this den of thieves, and he says, come follow me, and he becomes his disciple. And so if God will go that far out of his way for Matthew, imagine how far he would go for us. But sadly, our calling may not always be as clear as Matthew's. That would be very nice, especially with college, if you could just have like a turn-by-turn directions of where you should go, what you should study. But it doesn't happen that way. Sometimes you just have to embrace the unknown, and that's what makes leaving our comfort zone so difficult. And you worry, am I making the wrong decisions? What if this isn't exactly what God had planned for me, and I'm kind of just winging it? So it's really reassuring to know that if I stray from my path, or if I don't know what I'm doing with my life, then God will always be there with me. And that act, when I read this and thought about this, that actually reminded me of, for those of you who don't know, I'd like to become a doctor eventually. And when I first felt that calling was in the seventh grade, before then I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just knew I didn't want to be an engineer. Sorry guys, I just, I don't get it. <laughs> and so I was watching this, this documentary in my social studies class about this small African country named Burundi where they were so poor and they were, all these people were dying from the AIDS virus and not many people were doing anything about it. And I just thought, well, I could do something about that. So I guess I could be a doctor. And it just kind of blossomed from there. And I've always wanted to do medical research ever since. And the story of Matthew kind of backs that up that anyone can be a disciple. And, you know, it doesn't matter when you feel that calling. It's just that you know that that's what God wants you to do. But even after I read verse 9, I was still like, man, you know, God probably, you know, he doesn't want me to do this because I don't know where all of the books of the Bible are. I can't quote scripture. I miss more church than I'd like to admit. And I don't know all the answers to all the biblical questions. But that's when verses 10 through 13 come in. And that's when the Pharisees saw Jesus talking to this guy who took money from his own people, the people who Jesus claimed he was here to save. And so when they saw this, they asked the disciples, why is your teacher sitting with these sinners and sharing a meal with them? And it's something that I can relate to. I mean, if you saw the guy who you were entrusting your eternal life to sitting with these people who were just awful and took your money and were mean to you, you wouldn't be like, oh, okay, yeah, that's cool. Because we're looking at it from a point of view of humans and an earthly perspective of that guy is mean to me and he's mean to everyone else. Why would the guy who I'm you know, being nice for and doing good things for, why would he go out of his way to see that person? And what we don't realize is we aren't Jesus. You know, he's got an unconditional love for all of us. And he shows that in, I think it's verse 13. No, it's verse 12, when he says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And that's just showing how much God loves us unconditionally, that he would see this guy who's a tax collector and an awful human being. And he'd be like, man, I can bake that guy my disciple. And he did. And then in verse 13, he says to the Pharisees, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. That actually comes from the Old Testament in the book of Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6, where it says, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. And what Jesus is saying there is he values a loving relationship with us more than he values how often we go to church or how often we go to prayer meetings or if we understand the Bible. And these are all important things. I'm not trying to say that they're not. They're very important parts of our walk with Christ. But if we don't have a rooted relationship and love with Christ, then it won't mean as much or anything. And so once we have that loving relationship with him, we are able to do so much greater things through him. If he can take Matthew, and that day Matthew probably woke up thinking, man, this is going to be a normal day. going to go collect some taxes. Nothing's going to happen. And then he took Matthew out of that situation and he just transformed his life into becoming a disciple. And I'd say he was pretty successful because he's got a book of the Bible. So if that's not successful, I don't know what is. And if he can do that with someone like Matthew, he can surely do it with all of us. And so I'd like to conclude by saying, while we may not know what God's plan is for us, there will always be a plan. And there may be rough patches. And even sometimes there are parts that try our faith and shake us to our core. But we have to understand that God is much larger than us, and he sees the wide variety, like how long your life's going to go and what's going to happen in your life. And he has a plan, and it's always for our best. And I'd like to thank the church again.
I'd like to thank you all for giving me all the opportunities to serve and lead you all in worship. It means a lot to me. Um, thank you to Pastor Mike again for helping me prepare. And without him, I never would have found this part of the Bible. And it never would have affected me in the way it did. And I'd like to conclude by thanking all of my Sunday school teachers. There's so many of you, it's hard to list you all. And I'd forget someone. So thank you all for putting up with me in class, for showing me how to read the Bible and translate it into a way that I could understand it, and for setting an example for me of what good Christian people look like. And one man uh, did that more than anyone, and that was Nate Adams. He's not here with us today. Um, but he'd always end our Sunday school with this. He'd say, God is good. And we would respond with all the time. And then he would say all the time, God is good. So I'd like to do that now with you. God is good. All the time. All the time. Amen. Church Works is CBF's annual conference in February for ministers of education and spiritual formation. The tagline, Ministry, Creativity, Renewal, is the basis for how Church Works provides for those who attend. For three days at Church Works, Christian educators reflect together on their different ministry settings. They meet with other CBF colleagues for fellowship fun and sharing the latest resources and ideas. This conference also recognizes that ministry is both energizing and exhausting. Spiritual formation involves taking time for renewal and rest, so the schedule is built to encourage each person to experience those things as well. Pray that church works will be a meaningful time for ministers. Pray that it will continue to provide space for them as it celebrates the good work of ministers and their congregations. Pray for the planning team that organizes this conference that will meet in Asheville, North Carolina at the end of this month. Please join me in silent prayer. Amen.
seated. Hello. I'd just like to, buy, to start off saying by saying thank you to the church and all the people in it and how much it means to me. Ben nor I would be the people we are today without all the things that y'all have done for us and everyone else in the youth group. Without y'all's support, we wouldn't be able to do the things we love to do or even go on any retreats. Now, the retreats are some of my favorite things that the youth group does. Some, some are missions-based while others are spiritually based. I personally like the mission ones because they're always my favorite. I like those trips because... It feels like you're actually making a difference and you're taking action and solving problems. I consider this, this feeling of fixing issues to be one of the best feelings a Christian can feel. But when you get home and you come off of your mission high or your retreat high, you may start asking yourself, could I have done more? Or maybe if I just, we could have done more. Jesus did all he could. He traveled from city to city, synagogue to synagogue. He preached and preached and preached, but it was the crowd that ultimately moved him. They were like sheep without a shepherd. He felt compassion because they were harassed and helpless. They had no one to show them the way. And that's where we come in. God uses us to show others the way. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And we are those workers. We're called to be those workers, and we're called to take part in missions. We're called to make a difference. It seems like any time we help others find their way, it helps us find our way as well. One of my favorite sayings is it's not enough to believe in God. Even the devil believes in God. We must take action in spreading our faith. We are all laborers, and our job is to go out of our comfort zone, out of what is expected, and spread the faith. Laborers must stick together, support each other through the trials and test the mission work. But it all comes down to the basic principle that the sick need a doctor, not the healthy. We as Christians are harvesters, and the harvest is priority. The harvest is huge and vast, and you may be asking yourself, am I actually making a difference? But when I, ask my that, when I ask myself that question, I'm reminded of a story. An old man walks down the beach. He sees a young boy ahead of him throwing, throwing starfish into the, into the beach, right? Catching up with this man, he asks what he's doing. The answer was that the stranded starfish would die if left in the morning sun. But the beach goes on for miles, and there are millions of starfish, counted the old man. How is your effort going to make a difference? The man looked at the starfish in his hand, then threw it into the waves. It makes a difference to this one. It's kind of like the ripple effect. I'm sure you've heard it a million times, where one little drop causes a ripple, and then those ripples cause other ripples, and so on and so on. If you're ever feeling discouraged or thinking that you're not making a difference, remember that it only takes one small action, one small leap of faith, and you've already, do and you've already done that by investing in me, Ben, and the rest of the youth group. Everyone has doubts that you're actually making a difference every once in a while. But God helps us and guides us so that we can help others and guide others. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everyone to be able to come here and worship you today. Please help us, please help, please help us have the courage it takes to go out and help others find their way. Amen.
It's a great job, y'all. Before I uh, begin, I wanted to mention uh, a, just a follow-up on a couple of things that will be coming up for us this week. One is uh, Wednesday for our Ash Wednesday service at 615. That's a very special service. I hope that you'll take the opportunity in midweek to come here in our sanctuary, uh, children through adults. And uh, it's also a very busy time on Hughes Road, so be aware of that. We'll start at 615. So just be aware that we have a meal before that. We'd love for y'all to come and be a part of it. But it's a very special uh, service for us as we begin our preparation spiritually through the season we call Lent that prepares us for the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And also I just wanted to mention about this coming weekend. If you haven't had a chance to sign up to be a part of our uh, marriage workshop, uh, we'd love for you to do that. There's a sign-up sheet in the gathering area, so before you go, uh, do that. And it's uh, Mary and I are leading it. It's uh, what we call Marriage Workshop Light. Uh, we're just going to have a good time being together with couples and talk and share and laugh about some things, but we're not going to get very deep if you're worried about that. just going to be a good time to get to know other couples from the church together. And then on Sunday, we have our Valentine Banquet, and I know we've never done one before, but I'd love for you to be a part of it. It's... Uh, uh, not just for couples, it's for anybody who wants to come. One of my good friends from Nashville is coming to play and sing and play on the piano. Uh, he's very, very talented. He went all the way to California in the American Idol. Uh, so we're glad, I'm glad he'll be here. So that's all we're going to do. and We're going to eat good food and just be together. So anybody can come. But you need to sign up by Wednesday so we can get the food prepared. Now for our worship service. Uh, what a great job our youth have done today. Don't you agree? So proud of you. We are very, very proud of you. We are blessed people at Trinity because of our young people for the many, many ways that you inspire us. I say it to you all the time, but you do inspire us. You give us enthusiasm, and you remind us of one of the great reasons we do church. So thank you all for sharing your talents, your time, your gifts. And this is their second service today to do that. So uh, I know and our staff knows you can be a little exhausted after that. So eat lunch and go take a big, long nap today. But great, great job. Great job. And Ben and John have uh, really enjoyed working with you guys, getting prepared for this sort of three-part sermon thing that we do. And you all just, just knocked out of the park. You did an outstanding job. I'm a little envious of John's voice, what he projected. I was just so at ease when he got up there and spoke. Uh, ben, we talked about this. They say, well, I'm nervous. I'm going to pass out. <laughs> you know? and no, you don't look it at all. You look very poised. And I think God used you both today. And I want you to know that. And our musicians, y'all are just incredible. And we got the first time with the banjo today. That's awesome. That's awesome. Great job. And girls, what a way to start again. So it always amazes me because when we prepare for the sermon with the youth on Youth Sunday, they come and meet with me in the office and we start with a blank page. Uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll actually hand them a pad of paper and a pen, uh, or in this case Ben had his phone, so taking notes on a blank page. And sometimes you wonder, how is it actually going to work out? You know, you start with a blank page, but uh, it, it works out great, and we had these wonderful words from them today. Uh, God used them. And as I thought about that, it reminded me that that's what I do every Monday. I start with a blank page again after Sunday. Another Sunday's coming in the end of that week. So I look at that blank page sometimes in preparation for the next week's sermon, and I wonder, how do you write a sermon again? You know, how does this work? Is it going to happen? Uh, and as I do that, I have to remind myself that I'm not writing it by myself, just as you guys didn't. God is with me. God is with us when we write that. And I think that's a good analogy for the way life is for most of us. We all have a blank page that God has given us. It's our life. And every year and every day, we get another page to write. A page about what the message or the proclamation of our day will be. We get a chance to write some message. We get that blank page every day. And I wanted to say to you, as you look at that blank page, sometimes you can think, boy, it's really overwhelming. I don't know if I can do it. But I want you to remember that you're not writing it by yourself. You're doing it in the company of God. And in this passage that these guys dealt with so well today, it is a story of Jesus saying, as we write our page, the life of our, that we've been given by God, we write those pages every day. Let's invite people to help us to come along in the journey. So Jesus is doing that. He's inviting helpers to come along in that story of the great preparation for miss, uh, missions. He says, I've got a really incredible story, a message that I want to share with the entire world about how God loves and cares for everybody. And I want everybody to be a part of writing that story. So if you might think about it, there's times in your life when you face something that's very difficult. 
And probably all of us have had those times. And when those times come, we say, God, I need you to be here with me as I try to go through whatever it is I've got to go through. But the opposite is true here in this story. Jesus is saying, I've got a big mission too, and I'm inviting you to be with me as I begin to share and write this page of this great, glorious message of God's love in the world. So the passage is bookended by the words of Jesus, red letters in your Gospels. Come follow me at the beginning, and at the end, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out more workers, more helpers, because there's a lot of harvesting to be done. I'm always reminded of this movie I saw many years ago that I've always liked. It's based on a true story. It's called Chariots of Fire. It's an old movie, and it's about a guy that was going to run at the Olympics. And one of the qualifying heats for his race is on Sunday. And because of his faith, he says, I can't race on Sunday. I'm not going to do it. So there's all these meetings about what they're going to do. And this is the old days. They're actually on a ship on the way to Europe where the race is going to be held. And they're meeting, trying to decide what they're going to do because their best runner is not going to run on Sunday. And so right as they're about just almost frustrated about what to do, another runner comes in, another member of the Olympic team, and says, I've got an idea. We can do this. I'll run. He can do this. And so they're all sitting around on the, in the scene in the movie. And this is the Olympic committee, and they're all sitting around, and one of the old guys says, well, we can't decide this. This is a matter for the committee. And another guy on there says, well, we are the committee. We are the committee, right? And in a sense, what we saw today when our youth stood up before us is the embodiment of the work of the committee that God has put together here at Trinity. This is the committee of family and friends and your faithfulness over the years, when John and Ben were sitting down with me in the office on that blank page day, I said, well, how long have y'all been a part of Trinity? And I think there was something like we were born here, you know, we have been here all of their lives. And these guys are the living embodiment, and they talked about how much you meant to them. You're, you are the committee that God has put together, and every day you choose to take that blank page out and try to write a great story in partnership with Jesus Christ, you're mattering. You're making a difference in ways you may not ever realize. You're the committee of family and friends and church that is shaping people like all the ones we had who bravely got up here to lead us in both of these services. And I'm really proud of you for doing that. Jesus goes through the rest of the passage and there's a list of people that he helps. And there's all different people that he helps. And when we read that, we usually say, well, nobody's outside the availability of Jesus to help them, right? There's no qualifications. If you need help, it doesn't matter who you are, God's ready to help you, right? There's no restrictions on who can be helped. But the opposite is also true. There's also no restrictions on who God asks to help out. Not only do we receive from God freely, we're invited to participate freely in the work of the committee that God is putting together to shape lives over and over and over again. This past week, if you follow football at all, and most of you do because you live in, in Alabama, you know that Wednesday was National Signing Day for high school recruits to football teams, college football teams across the South. It is signing day when they can finally use this old thing called a fax machine. And they sign their letter of intent to go and, and play for a certain school. And there are services that rate how good high school football players are. And you may have seen this. They give them star ratings. So the very best players, Thomas and I were talking about this, and actually you could do better describing it than me, but he said he looked at a five-star rating as something like, you're ready to really go into the NFL. You could use one year of college, but you're so good, you could step right into the NFL. A four-star is somebody who's going to make it in the NFL. They just need a few years in college in preparation and they'll go. A three-star is someone who's ready to play college now. They can play college ball right now and they're ready to go. Two star and one stars are just you know great guys, great team guys. They're going to be great folks to have on your team. And I don't know about zero stars, but what I think Jesus is doing here is recruiting. He's recruiting this committee. He's giving us every day a blank page. And this is a good thing. Jesus doesn't give you a five star or one star rating or whatever. He doesn't care about the stars. He just offers this invitation. And when you think about it, you wonder, is it an invitation or is it a command? So you could hear it this way. Come, follow me. Invitation. Or you could also hear it. Come, follow me. This is a command. 
So it reminds me of Johnny Carson, who used to be on the Tonight Show before Jimmy Fallon. You know, he would tell a joke and he'd say, don't laugh, don't laugh. <laughs> you know, he'd do that. <laughs> so is it an invitation or is it a command? Whatever happens, Matthew leaves his tax booth and he starts following him. And he starts this blank page and he starts writing stuff. Then say, boy, it's cool that he got a gospel. It is cool. But I think it's equally cool and neat that each one of us have been recruited by God every day with our blank page to write a great story. To have an impact like that drop that, that John mentioned, that ripple in the wave to touch somebody's life. You never know. And what is most important for you to hear today is the people who will read the page that you write, the people who are going to read it the most are your children, your family members, and your friend. In the Bible and the Greek, the word is household oikos. Those are the people who will read the page of your life more than any others. The people who are your friends and your family and your co-workers and students who go to school with you. So I would just say to you today, when you think about Youth Sunday and you see these youth, you should smile along with me. Smile, 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 because they are the embodiment of the work of God's committee. Choosing every day to look at the blank page and say, I'm going to, with God's help, write a great story today. And let this day be a message of proclamation because that will be the drop I add and all the stories that's being written in the committee that will impact lives just like the ones we saw today. So I'm very proud that we have that. My question for you is, you get a page every day. What are you going to write on it? When I think about these youth, I think that the stakes are very high. But I also think the joy is very high too. Don't you? Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity and God bless you and keep you.